so a different tone uh, to this presentation from the last one. And uh, you should know me by now, but I'm, I'm Jay Coglin with uh, Nuclear Watch New Mexico. Um, I don't expect you to be able to see all this. Th this is more a memory device for me than anything. That's why I'm giving you a hard copy. Um, but as stated, uh, the subject is uh, explaining how New Mexico is America's uh, nuclear colony. And uh, I'm particularly fond of the subtitle, Money Doesn't Talk, It Swears. That's Bob Dylan from uh, It's All Right, Ma, I'm Only Dying. So, yeah, <laughs> you know that one, do you? Okay, so uh, people who were here Tuesday evening, I'm, I made clear how much I love this state. I, I'm just crazy about this state, uh, but it's weird. It's right up there with, say, Nevada and Louisiana. What, what's up? Uh, So it's a, it's a very strange uh, uh, state. Uh, sometimes, well, first of all, uh, the nickname is uh, Land of Enchantment. Uh, by some of us natives, uh, we go by the Land of Entrapment uh, sometimes. I also like to call it the uh, Land of uh, Radioactive Waste and Wasted Priests. But that's a whole other uh, story right there. But basically, why do we have this nuclear colony? And I would submit that in large part because it's poor. And uh, for a long time, until only about a decade ago, it was the only state that had a minority majority. And it's roughly 50% Hispanic, 12% uh, Native American. Now, in contrast to that, uh, Los Alamos County uh, is more than 70% uh, uh, non-Hispanic uh, Caucasian. Uh, we have these massive disparities between New Mexico and the privileged enclave that's represented by Los Alamos County. I list a lot of it here. Um, Los Alamos County, that's uh, LAC. Los Alamos County is the 11th richest county in the United States. It used to be number two in terms of... Uh, median household uh, income. It's fallen to uh, 11th. Uh, and you'll see that New Mexico is the uh, fourth uh, poorest state. Uh, you see some of these other uh, socioeconomic uh, indicators. Uh, you see that median household income in Los Alamos County, 123 grand. Uh, it's 54 grand for the rest of uh, New Mexico. You see uh, per capita income. Los Alamos County has the least number of children living in poverty. The state of New Mexico has the most in all of the uh, USA. Uh, Los Alamos County has been rated as the best county. There's, there's more than 3,000 counties in, in the USA. Los Alamos County has been rated the best county uh, to live in. And that's because it does have a nice outdoor lifestyle. It has completely uh, paid medical benefits. Uh, it has very, very good schools. Uh, but in contrast, uh, New Mexico has things like the highest rate of alcoholism. Uh, until the o opioid uh, epidemic across the country, uh, Rio Riba County, which is just below Los Alamos Lab, uh, for decades had the highest rate of ODs from heroin. Uh, it just goes uh, on and on. Um, one thing that the New Mexican uh, congressional delegation does in providing what I call a threefold rationale uh, for expanding nuclear weapons programs, uh, and that threefold rationale is jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, so that's what it gets sold on. The reality is uh, New Mexico as a whole has fallen from being 32nd in 1959 in per capita income to 47th now. So, you know, I can't tie that directly to the nuclear weapons industry. And of course, there's other very large industries, specifically oil and gas and tourism. Um, but it does run counter to generally uh, what I would describe as the economic propaganda that we get both from the Department of Energy 
um, and from our own uh, congressional uh, delegation. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out, um, and, and I just, this stuns me, is in the pending fiscal year, uh, federal fiscal year that's going to begin this October 1st, the Department of Energy is going to spend more money in New Mexico, that's $10 billion, than the state of New Mexico has for its entire operating budget. And that gives you some idea of the scale of things and, and why, like as activists, we have such a problem in countering uh, the DOE economic uh, propaganda in, and in trying to posit alternative uh, uh, programs that can uh, produce jobs. So when I say operating budget, it, it, that's just like the federal budget. You know, the feds have a discretionary budget. It doesn't include Social Security and Medicare. In New Mexico's case, this does not include Medicaid. But again, what DOE is going to spend in New Mexico is 6% bigger than the state of New Mexico's entire operating budget. So I just find that stunning. And it, it gives you an idea of the money uh, that we're uh, up against. Uh, just Continuing on, and I, I can go through this fairly quickly, um, it's of historic interest that the lands that Los Alamos live, you know, exists upon were seized, forcibly seized, during the World War II years uh, from both Hispanic homesteaders and San Ildefonso Pueblo. And those people, the Hispanic homesteaders got a pittance maybe about 15 years ago in financial compensation, but there was nothing just and fair about it. And now when DOE transfers excess lands, th those transfers primarily go to the white wealthy county of Los Alamos. So to me, there's really grave environmental uh, justice uh, issues. Uh, we visited, just visited Trinity Test, so here we go. It, it started here in the uh, land of uh, in, enchantment. Um, we have very extensive uranium mining, and there are thousands of sick Navajo and Laguna Pueblo uranium miners. Um, it's a disgrace that the federal government does not have a good tally of exactly how many sick Native American uranium uh, miners, and this also includes uranium mills, uh, but it's a dis uh, disgrace. The feds don't have a good uh, number on that. Um, we have the fact, and you all heard Tina Cordova, and Lois can speak to it uh, as well, um, but we have the uh, downwinders of the uh, first atomic tests that have never been compensated. And by the way, the first sovereign nation that ever experienced fallout was the Mescalero Indians uh, just east of the uh, Trinity test. You never hear about that. Um, we do have major groundwater contamination at Los Alamos from uh, hexavalent uh, chromium. And that was the contaminant of a concern in the Aaron Brockovich uh, movie. And it, the laboratory, they're very good at designing nuclear weapons. You gotta give them credit. They're not so good at, at producing them, but that's another story. They're very good at designing nuclear weapons, but when it comes to understanding the environmental uh, problems that they have, I think there's willful ignorance, and they still don't know what the extent of that chromium groundwater contamination is what we do know now is that it's a mile long, a half mile wide across, and about 250 uh, feet deep. Um, but as you can see, this is a semi-arid uh, state, and the issue of future water supplies is crucial. This is contamination of a groundwater aquifer that supplies drinking water to 300,000 uh, people. Uh, knowing that I have to move towards wrapping up, Concerning cleanup, the basic plan at Los Alamos is to cap and cover, that's in quotes, cap and cover and permanently leave 
over 200,000 cubic yards of mixed waste, that's radioactive and hazardous waste, buried in online pits and trenches. And like any municipality here in this state, if they apply to get a land dump, you know, from the environment department, there's this whole thing, they got to put liners in, they got to put in leachate collection systems, but not Los Alamos as, as a federal facility. They just literally dump drums of waste and box of waste into online uh, pits and uh, trenches. Um, now, when, when you all uh, fly out of the Albuquerque airport, this, this is to give you a sweet memory of New Mexico as you fly out. And generally, the planes take off east. So if you're on the right-hand side of the plane, look south about a mile and a half. You're not going to see anything, but know that that's the country's largest repository of uh, nuclear warheads up to about 2,500 warheads. They're not deployed, they're in a active reserve, but they are the largest uh, repository of intact warheads in the country and maybe uh, the world. Uh, to wrap up, at Los Alamos is currently the nation's only pit production facility. And I don't believe that this is coincidental at all we also have the nation's only underground geologic dump for those plutonium wastes. So that's certainly uh, very uh, convenient. And then finally, um, and, and I, I must add, the state of New Mexico is trying to impose new operating conditions uh, on the waste isolation pilot plant. And, it, you know, I'm not. This is like stating the obvious. I think the Department of Energy is going to end up suing the state of New Mexico to quash uh, the, these new conditions that uh, the Environment Department is trying to uh, impose. And WIP, by the way, it permits expires next year. But the Department of Energy is assuming in writing that WIP will be open until 2050 to accept the new waste, the new radioactive waste from new uh, plutonium pit production. Uh, the last specific item is that the land of enchantment is also being targeted to accept all of the nation's commercial high level waste. And we're talking on the order of, of 100,000 metric tons of spent fuel rods. And this is the stuff that's lethal that without shielding, uh, you will die by this stuff, uh, standing by it. And recently, uh, within the last month, the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission granted a license for this uh, facility, despite the unanimous opposition of the New Mexico uh, congressional uh, delegation. So you see my argument uh, why um, New Mexico is America's uh, nuclear colony. I'll just close with two anecdotes. Uh, the first is to illustrate how the nuclear weaponeers are just swimming in money nowadays. And I, I was skiing up at uh, Santa Fe uh, Ski Basin a couple of months ago, and I got on the chairlift with uh, two strangers, and one asked the other what this guy does, and he, he goes, uh, Oh, I'm a scientist at, at Los Alamos. And the other guy probed him a little bit more. And uh, so he elaborated by just saying, I'm a weapons scientist. But then he goes, at least I used to be a scientist. All I do now is hand out money. And that, that's a verbatim quote. They are so awash uh, in money. Uh, my second anecdote um, this is meant to illustrate like where the New Mexico congressional delegation is. Um, but on Tuesday, uh, I mentioned that I, I had sued uh, Sig Hecker. And of course, that was in his uh, official capacity. It was a Clean Air Act lawsuit. And um, some of us, about three of us, went down as a courtesy to tell Senator Pete Domenici that we were suing uh, because he was a very, very powerful uh, senator. And the labs called him St. Pete for the money that he would bring uh, to them. But anyway, as stated, as courtesy, we come down here to Albuquerque to tell him 
we're going to sue the lab under the Clean Air Act. First thing that happens is that his chief of staff jumps up, waves his arms around, and calls us environmental radicals. Um, but the, we got the last laugh. We beat Los Alamos. Uh, five years later, a federal judge ruled that they were in a major uh, violation. Um, but the point, or the anecdote I'm bringing up, Domenici, if nothing else, was candid. I'll give him that much. So he volunteered and stated out loud that he had three priorities. And that the first thing he said was that he spent more time as a U.S. Senator on DOE issues in New Mexico than more than half of his time on DOE issues in New Mexico. And I didn't say this to him, but that in my mind that immediately raised the question of who do you really represent? You know, do you represent DOE or do you represent New Mexicans? He also said at the same time that the lab directors could call him by his bedside. You know, they, they were buds and they were that close. The second thing he said was that his number one priority was getting money to the Sandia and Los Alamos labs. And then the third thing he said is, and the way I get the money to the labs is through the nuclear weapons programs because 98 other senators won't argue with me about that. Now that's not quite, that's not as true anymore. Um, but anyway, that is, <laughs> I have nothing in writing uh, that is, you know, verbatim, nearly verbatim, what this extremely powerful uh, senator have had uh, said to me. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of like the political structure uh, in this, um, in this uh, state. I, I'll close now, Peter, but it should be noted that Domenici was on Senate Energy and Water Appropriations. That is the subcommittee that ponies up money for DOE and the labs. So following that, that's exactly where Tom Udall went, right to Senate, to, uh, Senate Energy and Water. And of great, if, if you lobby Congress, if you go to Congress much, you know that the sausage gets ground in the subcommittees. That's where the action uh, happens. So I noted with great interest that Heinrich, he had a really good seat on Armed Services Strategic Forces, but when an opening came up on Senate Energy and Water, he bailed for that. And Dianne Feinstein, who's chairwoman, her, her days are limited. I think Heinrich's uh, angling to be chair of Senate Energy and Water to keep that pipeline of uh, money rolling to the labs. With that, I'll stop. Uh, Peter, but I love Q&A, and I will entertain questions until Peter says I can't. And he says five minutes. <laughs> okay, well, maybe go for a minute. Uh, thank you, Jim. That's disturbing, enlightening, not unexpected uh, report on the state of the, okay, the state of the state. Okay. That's the shit. Questions, please, please. Uh, name. Uh, if y'all didn't hear it, uh, make sure I rephrase this correctly. He was asking what power private uranium mining corporations have. Um, I, now, first of all, I'm not that expert uh, in it. And uranium mining, um, of course, the motivation for uranium mining goes up and down according to market prices of uh, uranium. There is some there's a proposal to have in situ leaching of uranium out by Crown Point, um, which is Crown Point actually on the Navajo yeah, Reservation? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Right on the edge of the reservation, yeah. But in, in situ leaching is sending uh, cyanide 
down into the uranium ore to leach out the uranium and then recover it. And that doesn't sound like a very good idea to me, send cyanide <laughs> down into the ground to uh, leach out uh, uranium. So that's the one project uh, that I know about, uh, but I do not know it uh, in depth. And again, motivation fluctuates with market prices, which goes up and down a lot. Question? Please, please. Sorry. Num number one concern. Uh, the fact that no pit production is needed to maintain the safety and reliability of the existing stockpile. All future pit production is for new nuclear weapons designs specifically starting with the W87-1, which will be for the Air Force's new intercontinental ballistic missile. And that particular design is a mishmash of three different warheads. The government says it has tested those components, but they haven't tested them in combination. And we know that pit designs are going to change. So what I'm getting to my biggest fear. This aggressive movement towards new design nuclear weapons, there's kind of two prongs to it. Pits are the one thing that cannot be tested because of the international testing moratorium. Or alternatively, it could induce the U.S. to resume testing, after which all hell would break loose. Now, if you, but on the other hand, if you don't test it, it could arguably undermine national security by eroding confidence uh, in reliability. Uh, so that, that's my biggest fear, is that it could actually de degrade national security in, in two ways, undermining confidence in the stockpile, possibly uh, prompting the U.S. to uh, resume testing. That number one concern. Below that, this is quick, the exorbitant expense. A rogue agency getting away with spending $60 billion and not being held accountable. No credible cost estimate, no integrated master schedule. Uh, what I regard as the arrogance, the widespread contamination, the diversion of massive <laughs> amounts of money into something that, in my view, will not improve national security when that money would be better redirected towards in this state. At, at this time last year, this state was on fire, literally. That money would be better directed towards wildfire prevention and addressing climate change. Those are real threats to New Mexicans. As is public health. Any more? Any questions? Any questions? Hello, from Je uh, Je uh, Jeju Press. So, could you tell me about the uh, recent and current momentum in the about uh, anti-nuclear movement in New Mexico? So, is it stagnant, or how about the new young generation's reaction of your um, activities? Um, you know the. Uh, we hold a weekly protest in downtown Santa Fe every Friday at noon because Los Alamos is starting to, uh, it has a new office in Santa Fe. Um, and I'm sad to report to you that we're all old. We're all gray hairs. Um, there, there's a couple of young people, but, but not many. However, I'm beginning to notice a little bit of a change. And then, as you know, uh, this thing that's going with the Archbishop, hopefully this will help generate more of a interfaith movement within New Mexico. New Mexico, by the way, as a demographic fact, is at least nominally 40% Catholic. Um, so, and, but what the Archbishop is doing 
it, it's also intentional to have it be both interfaith and no faith at all. So hopefully we will generate more of a movement within this state. But what's critical, and, and the, the archbishop, he, he knows this, he is a babe in the woods when it comes to politics. <laughs> it's crucial that what we are trying to do gets translated into political effect with the aim of actually getting to the New Mexico congressional delegation. That what has to happen. And then in addition, I won't take much longer, but as you know, we have the pending trip to Japan that hopefully gives it um, an international dimension uh, as well. So that's the hope. Can I ask about the Los Alamos study group? Yeah. Greg Mello. Mm -hmm. Do you work with them? No. What's your relationship? Uh, we are mortal enemies. Uh, yeah, I, I'll be frank about it. He has publicly stated, and he has said to reporters and uh, politicians, that I'm a paid agent of DOE. <laughs> and the reason I know that is, uh, first of all, Patrick, I shouldn't mention names, a reporter with the New Mexican told me that, and the mayor of Santa Fe told me that while he was still mayor. So, you know, I occasionally uh, get asked this question, and I make no bones about it. We are mortal enemies. Not only that, uh, you know, obviously it's per. You're writing that they support uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Where's Valeria? Where's our resident Ukrainian? Hey, yeah, he, he does. Here's the, I was starting to say, obviously this is personal, but there's more than just personal. He's just flat out wrong. <laughs> One of them being his, uh, well, he, he said at the beginning that the Ukrainians should just surrender. Okay, there's that. Then he supports pip production at Savannah River. I wanna make clear what my position is. Pip production already exists at, at Los Alamos. It's always going to be inherently limited by the lab's incompetence, by its culture, because the lab thinks it's white collar, you know, scientists, not blue collar production. The topography is going to keep it limited, and there is greater public opposition uh, in, the, in the regional area to pip production. Savannah River, on the other hand, but this is my fear. Uh, it, it's questionable that it ever gets established there. But if it does, it could potentially be Rocky Flats light producing a couple of hundred pits <coughs> per year. So I want to keep the already, the, the existing pit production at Los Alamos, which is all currently limited to not more than 20 pits per year, and they're not even capable of doing that. I want to keep that and prevent uh, plutonium pit production at uh, Savannah River. So I was candid with you. That's the situation. Um, I, 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 I should I should not say more. <laughs> one one last. It would be a what? Yeah, Savannah, Savannah could be Rocky Flats light. Well, as I said, there are so many inherent constraints to existing pit production at LANL. LANL will never, the National Nuclear Security Administration wants, and it's also a congressional statutory requirement, by the way, that was written by a lab person, but that's another story. Uh, the statutory requirement is 80 pits per year I mean, in between the two sites. LANL will never be able to do that. 